Hello and welcome back to Supposedly Fun. My name is Greg and I'm here today to talk about my pile of possibilities for Pride Month. If you're new here, because a lot of new people have come on to this channel since my Pulitzer reaction. Hi. In June, I like to read Pride books because June is obviously Pride Month. So I prioritize queer authors, queer stories, and all of that kind of thing. I say pile of possibilities just as a footnote because I don't like TBR. To me, for whatever reason, TBR sounds very formal and you say if this is to be read, you have to read it. Pile of possibilities sounds friendlier and like in the more in the spirit of how I think about this, which is that this is a pile of books that I'm going to select from. I, I don't intend to get to all of these books. I don't think I will. There are too many of them. However, I would like to get to as many of them as possible and they are the options that I will be pulling from. For my physical pile of possibilities, I limited myself to books that I have in my possession right now, not things that I would like to grab. Things that are either on my shelves or I have from the library. I have some library books that we'll talk about at the end of the physical TBR. For my audio pile of possibilities, because I usually have one physical book and one audio going at the same time, I have only listed books that I know I have access to. So really scribbed Libro, things like that, or things that I've already had on Libro and uh, would just really like to get to. So without further ado, because I have a lot of books, again, I'm giving myself a lot of options. Let's dive in. This is a huge pile. So the first thing is actually something that is carrying over from May. In the month of May, for the E.M. Forster read-along, I'll include links to details about that and the queer TBR tackle down below. We were reading A Room with a View. I didn't finish it because I got to it right at the end of the month. And as it stands right now, I have a little more than 100 pages left in the book. So I'm filming this on May 31st. And I'm not going to finish. So this is going to carry into the month of June. So I'm just going to include it, not necessarily because it's on my pile of possibilities, but because it is something that I will finish in the month of June. And I mentioned the Queer TBR Tackle. Again, information about that will be down below. So basically, the premise of that is Jen the Librarian and I decided to tackle books that we have on our shelves that we have had the longest. And of course, obviously, we wanted to focus on queer ones. So she selected some from her shelf. I selected some from mine. And we spread them out throughout the year and invited other people to do their own queer TBR tackle and read along with ours if they would like. The book that we have assigned for June is Stone Butch Blues by Leslie Feinberg. This is something that I have been wanting to read for a very long time, and I would be very happy to finally get around to. This book is particularly interesting because Leslie Feinberg wanted the book to be available to people, not just people who had money to access it. So there is a PDF of this book online, or you can buy a print copy at cost. That is obviously the route that I went. And therefore, hopefully you will be able to get a copy if this is something that sounds interesting to you. For each of these books, I'll have a quick blurb about them just to give you a sense of what they are about. Maybe you would like to read them as well. Here's the blurb for Stone Butch Blues. Published in 1993, this brave original novel is considered to be the finest account ever written of the complexities of a transgendered existence. Woman or man, that's the question that rages like a storm around Jess Goldberg, clouding her life and her identity. Growing up differently gendered in a blue-collar town in the 1950s, coming out as a butch in the bars and factories of the pre-feminist 60s, deciding to pass as a man in order to survive when she is left without work or a community in the early 70s. This powerful, provocative, and deeply moving novel sees Jess coming full circle. She learns to accept the complexities of being a transgendered person in a world demanding simple explanations, a he-she emerging whole, weathering the turbulence. I think this will be a fascinating read, and it is something that I've been looking forward to for a long time. Hopefully this Pride Month will be the time, if there's one book that I actually managed to read in the month of June, it should be this one, because it is for the Queer TBR Tackle, and there are a lot of people on the Discord channel who will be, will be reading it as well. So if you're interested, again, details will be down below. I'm really looking forward to it. I, I have very high hopes for it. And actually, I have really high hopes for the next book, which, so if I read one book in June, it should be Stone Butch Blues because of the queer TBR tackle. If I read one other book, I would like it to be My Government Means to Kill Me by Rashid Newsom. This is sort of a five-star prediction for me. And when I read the description, I think you will understand why I'm really excited to read it. 
Earl Trey Singleton III arrives in New York City with only a few dollars in his pocket. Born into a wealthy black Indianapolis family, at 17, he is ready to leave his overbearing parents and their expectations behind. I should mention, this is set in the 1980s in New York City. So, allow that to be a little bit of context for you. In the city, Trey meets up with a cast of characters that changes his life forever. He volunteers at a renegade home hospice for AIDS patients, and after being put to the test by gay rights activists, becomes a member of the AIDS Coalition to Unleash Power. Act up. Along the way, Trey attempts to navigate past traumas and searches for ways to maintain familial relationships, all while seeking the meaning of life amid so much death. I find books about... AIDS and that whole thing, uh, depressing, but fascinating. I think they are important things that we need to remember. The perspective of a young black man coming of age at that time is going to be fascinating, I think, and it would be particularly fraught. I just have very high hopes for this book, and I'm really looking forward to it. I actually do have access to this on audio. However, there are footnotes throughout the book, and I asked someone, someone commented when I brought this book up in the past, and they said that the footnotes are not in the audio. It's just difficult to include footnotes in an audio. So for that reason, I really want to read this in print. So Stone Butch Blues and My Government Means to Kill Me are my highest priority books in the month of June, for obvious reasons. Next, we have Gordo by Jaime Cortez, Shedding profound natural light on the inner lives of migrant workers, Jaime Cortez's debut collection ushers in a new era of American literature that gives voice to a marginalized generation of migrant workers in the West. The first ever collection of short stories by Jaime Cortez, Gordo is set in a migrant workers' camp near Watsonville, California in the 1970s. A young, probably gay, boy named Gordo puts on a wrestler's mask and throws fists with a boy in the neighborhood, fighting his own tears as he tries to grow into the idea of manhood so imposed on him by his father. As he comes of age, Gordo learns about sex, watches his father's drunken fights, and discovers even his own documented Mexican-American parents are wary of illegal migrants. This book just sounds really fascinating. I love the idea of the perspective. I love the story and the complexities of the immigrant experience. I am really looking forward to this one as well. I I should say right now, I did not try to front load this video. It's just sort of naturally happening, but this is one that I would really like to get to. I purchased a copy of this when it made the ALA Notable list the year after it was published. And it just sounded so fascinating to me because of the little description they had of it. And uh, I've wanted to read it ever since. So this is kind of my kick in the pants (laughs) to myself that I really want to get to this book. And uh, hopefully this Pride Month will be the time. Then I tried to do a lot of variety in my pile of possibilities list because I don't really know what I'm going to be in the mood for. And I have some heavier books as well. I have some lighter books, especially on audio. I really leaned into lighter books on audio to try to break some things up. And I don't know if I will be feeling horror short stories, but I felt like because this is a slim volume and because it would meet one of the prompts on Montana Book Company's reading challenge for 2023, which is on Storygraph, by the way, um, I figured I would put it here and try to encourage myself to get it out of the way now. It is something that I would be very interested in. I don't know how much of the content of the stories themselves are queer, but Eric LaRocca is a queer author, so it fits the bill just by dint of that. Eight stories of literary dark fiction from a master storyteller exploring the shadow side of love. These are tales of grief, obsession, control, intricate examinations of trauma and tragedy in raw, poetic prose. I don't think I said the name of this book, actually, so shame on me. It's The Trees Grew Because I Bled There, Collected Stories by Eric LaRocca. This is something I purchased on Independent Bookstore Day because Chelsea at Montana Book Company just became obsessed with Eric LaRocca, and she says it's not the type of thing that she would usually read. It's definitely not the type of thing that I would usually read, but she loved it, so I'm willing to give it a try. This was the one of Eric LaRocca's books that she said she enjoyed the most, so here it is, and here it is again on my pile of possibilities for Pride Month. Again, just trying to give myself a lot of options so I have something for whatever mood I might be. I tend to be a mood reader, 
and I always want to give myself options. Back in the day when I would go on vacation, I was I, I was that person who would bring like 10 different books on a five day vacation or even though like just a one week vacation or two week vacation when you were never going to read that many books j just because I wanted to give myself options for whatever mood I might be in. Next, I've also tried to select some smaller books. Uh, Eric LaRocca kind of fits that as well. And this one, a minor chorus, a novel by Billy Ray Belcourt, definitely fits that brief. It is under 200 pages. Looks like 159. In the stark expanse of northern Alberta, a queer indigenous doctoral student steps away from his dissertation to write a novel informed by a series of poignant encounters, a heart-to-heart -heart with fellow doctoral student River over the mounting pressure placed on marginalized scholars, a meeting with Michael, a closeted man from his hometown whose vulnerability and loneliness punctuate the realities of queer life on the fringe. Woven throughout these conversations are memories of Jack, cousin caught in the cycle of police violence, drugs, and survival. Jack's life parallels the narrator's own. The possibilities of escape and imprisonment are left to chance with colonialism stacking the odds. I, I was recommended this book a while ago by a commenter on this channel, and it really fits my interest as a reader, so I ordered a copy from Montana Book Company, like, immediately, and this is myself giving myself that's terrible grammar, but giving myself a kick in the pants to read this book. And again, I think if I include some shorter books, this will feel even less overwhelming since there are a lot of books that I am giving myself as possibilities. Then we get to The Inexplicable Logic of My Life by Benjamin Alir Sands. If you follow along, you know I am a huge fan of Aristotle and Dante Discover the Secrets of the Universe and Aristotle and Dante Dive into the Waters of the World. This is not part of that series. It's not a third book. It's just another book by Benjamin Alir Sands. And Joel read it the same year that he read the Aristotle and Dante books, and he absolutely loved it. So it's been on my radar ever since. It's been prioritized ever since. It's been on my radar since before then, but uh, I, it's definitely something that I would like to get to. And again, this is myself giving a kick in the pants to me. Sal used to know his place with his adoptive gay father, their loving Mexican-American family, and his best friend, Samantha. But it's senior year, and suddenly Sal is throwing punches, questioning everything, and realizing he no longer knows himself. If Sal's not who he thought he was, who is he? I love Benjamin Alir Sands, and uh, this is, would be a great opportunity to read another one of his books. It's definitely not a short book, but I think it would read quickly. These chapters look like they're fairly short, and I'm just checking, trying to see how many pages it is. 445, so it's a lot longer than some of the other books on this pile of possibilities, but I think it would read quickly. So, it seems like a good possibility for me. Then we have another slightly chunky book, True Biz by Sarah Novick. The students at the River Valley School for the Deaf just want to hook up, pass their history finals, and have politicians, doctors, and their parents stop telling them what to do with their bodies. This revelatory novel plunges readers into the halls of a residential school for the deaf. And I believe at least one of those characters is queer. So, here it is on my pile of possibilities for Pride Month. This is something that I wanted to read since it was released last year, and I uh, want—I definitely want to do it this year because it would meet a prompt for the Montana Book Company's reading challenge for 2023 to read a book either by a deaf author or featuring deaf characters. This would be both. <laughs> so uh, definitely it would do that. So I will probably be reading this in 2023 if I don't make it into June, but this would be a nice opportunity to do it. So I'm including it on my list. And by the way, I, since I've mentioned it several times, I'll include uh, a link to my video about Montana Book Company's 2023 Reading Challenge down below as well. So you can look for that there if you are new and if you are, again, hi. <laughs> then we have The Town of Babylon by Alejandro Varela. This was on the, definitely on the long list for the National Book Award last year. I think it was on the short list. I can't really remember. But it immediately jumped out to me from the long list as something that I would like to read. And I managed to get a copy of it. I don't like this cover at all, but the book sounds fascinating and I've gotten really good feedback on it from some people that I trust. So I would love to read it. 
In this contemporary debut novel, An Intimate Portrait of Queer, Racial, and Class Identity, Andre, a gay Latinx professor, returns to his suburban hometown in the wake of his husband's infidelity. There he finds himself with no excuse not to attend his 20-year high school reunion and hesitantly begins to reconnect with people he used to call friends. Over the next few weeks, while caring for his aging parents and navigating the neighborhood where he grew up, Andre falls into old habits with friends he thought he had left behind. Before long, he unexpectedly becomes entangled with his first love and is forced to tend to past wounds. I think it sounds fascinating, and again, I've gotten some really good feedback on it, so I would love to read this book, and June would be a perfect opportunity to do so. Continuing on. So, so far, I haven't really gotten into anything that could be called a heavy or sad book. And I'm going to tiptoe into those waters with the next two. I think the, the next one is probably more in that vein. I've heard that A Place Called Winter by Patrick Gale can be a little bit heavy and a little bit serious. Um, but I've also heard really good things about it. So I figured I'm going to give myself the option to allow myself to be emotionally devastated in the month of June. And I gave myself two options that would do that, um, for sure. Here is what it says. A privileged elder son and stammeringly shy, Harry Kane has followed convention at every step. Even the beginnings of an illicit, dangerous affair do little to shake the foundations of his muted existence until the shock of discovery and the threat of arrest cost him everything. This is historical fiction, by the way. Forced to abandon his wife and child, Harry signs up for emigration to the newly colonized Canadian prairies. Remote and unforgiving, his allotted homestead in a place called Winter is a world away from the golden suburbs of turn-of-the-century Edwardian England. And yet it is here, isolated in a seemingly harsh landscape under the threat of war, madness, and an evil man of undeniable magnetism that the fight for survival will reveal in Harry an inner strength and capacity for love beyond anything he has ever known before. I've heard really good things about it from a couple of different people, people who have channels and from people who have left comments. So I would love to get to this book at some point. Again, June seems like it would be a good time to do so. Then we have the other book that would be emotionally devastating. I've mentioned several times that I have never read a Column to Bean book, and I have been kind of all over the map in terms of which one I would like to be my first read by him. And what I've kind of settled on is that I want it to be Blackwater Lightship, which was shortlisted for the Booker Prize. And I think this one probably fits my interests as a reader the most. Some people have kind of come back to say that... Um, it focuses on three women who are not queer, so it might not fit, but how, I, I think it still qualifies for my Pride Month pile of possibilities. So here it is, and here is what the quick blurb says. It is Ireland in the early 1990s. Helen, her mother Lily, and her grandmother Dora have come together to tend to Helen's brother Declan, who is dying of AIDS. With Declan's two friends, the six of them are forced to plumb the shoals of their own histories and to come to terms with each other. It sounds emotionally devastating. It is kind of on the slim side, although I don't know how long it actually is. 273 pages. I really want to read a column to Bean book, and this would be a great opportunity to do it. I loved the book The Prettiest Star by Carter Sickles, and this sort of gives me shades of that. And I would just love to read it. So I don't know that I'm going to be ready to be emotionally devastated in the month of June. Personal things I won't get into. But um, if I am, this would be a great book to uh, sort of <laughs> tick that box for sure. And then I've sort of balanced it out by a lot of lighter options and things that might uh, just be quick reads, uh, hopefully to balance it out if I manage to get to it at all. Then, another book I picked up on Independent Bookstore Day this year is Flamer by Mike Carrato. This is one of the most challenged books in the country, which is sort of why I purchased it. It's a graphic novel, so it should read really quickly. And uh, I, I would love to support a banned book, so here it is. It's the summer between middle school and high school, and Aiden Navarro is away at camp. Everyone's going through changes, but for Aiden, the stakes feel higher. As he navigates friendships, deals with bullies, and spends time with Elias, a boy he can't stop thinking about, he finds himself on a path of self-discovery and acceptance. Again, I would just really would like to support banned books. This seems like a gimme, because even though it is a bit chunky, it's over 300 pages, 
it is a graphic novel and I believe sort of a coming of age YA one at that. So it should read really quickly. And uh, I wanted to give myself some things that I could, you know, it's, it's important sometimes to set achievable goals. So I've mixed in some very achievable books on my list. Now we get into the three library books that will round out my physical pile of possibilities and then we'll get into the audio one really quickly. The first one is something I just recently saw on Doris at Aldi Books channel. She was looking at some graphic novels and one of them was Wash Day Diaries by Jamila Rouser and Robin Smith. It sounded interesting and I immediately looked it up and one thing I noticed is that it has queer elements and that made me think, ah, oh, if my library has it, it would be perfect for Pride Month. My library did have it, so here it is, and because it is here in my hands, I can include it on my pile of possibilities for Pride Month. Wash Day Diaries tells the story of four best friends, Kim, Tanisha, Devine, and Cookie, through five connected short story comics that follow these young women through the ups and downs of their daily lives in the Bronx. The book takes its title from the wash day experience shared by black women everywhere and set of setting aside all plans and responsibilities for a full day of washing, conditioning, and nourishing their hair. Each short story uses hair routines as a window into these four characters' everyday lives and how they care for each other. I think that's such an interesting approach to telling connected stories, and a graphic novel format uh, is a really interesting way of approaching that as well. So I would love to read this. Again, achievable goals. I have two graphic novels on here and a couple of really short books, so I feel like I'm setting myself up for success, but giving myself some more challenging options as well. And the next one actually kind of ties in with set achievable goals. It's Different for Boys by Patrick Ness. Friendship, masculinity, sex. Anthony Stevenson has a lot of questions. Is it different for boys who like boys? A poignant and frank story filled with meta-humor by renowned author Patrick Ness. I've never read a Patrick Ness book. This is really short, as you can see, and balancing that out is the fact that there are a lot of illustrations. So it's 97 pages, and again, there are a lot of pages that have drawings. It, right here in the middle of the book is just a two-page spread of <laughs> a drawing. There is no text. And another thing that's interesting about this is it sort of censors words um, that might be naughty and things like that. It's, it's just an interesting way of framing a book. So again, it should make it also read really quickly. So achievable goals, I'm giving myself some options. Then we have When We Were Sisters by Fatima Oscar. This is the last book from my physical pile of possibilities. I had gotten it from the library and it seemed like a perfect fit. So I was able to renew all of these library books through the end of June. So we're in good shape. I should be able to hold on to them and hopefully we'll be able to get to them. In this heart-rending lyrical debut work of fiction, the acclaimed author of If They Come For Us traces the intense bond of three orphaned siblings who, after their parents die, are left to raise one another. The youngest, Kossar, grapples with the incomprehensible loss of their parents as she also charts out her own understanding of gender. Aisha, the middle sister, spars with her crybaby younger sibling as she desperately tries to hold on to her sense of family in an impossible situation. And Noreen, the eldest, does her best in the role of sister mother while also trying to create a life for herself on her own terms. Sounds fascinating. This was long listed for the National Book Award. I don't believe it made it onto the shortlist, and it just won the inaugural Carol Shields Prize for fiction, which includes women and non-binary authors and I would really like to read it. So here it is on my Pride Month pile of possibilities. Let's move into the audio pile of possibilities and talk about the books that I have given myself as options here. The first one is interesting. It's nonfiction. It's Fire Island, Love, Loss, and Liberation in an American Paradise by Jack Parlett. Sounds fascinating. Now, I hate the American cover of this book, which is what I will put up first. I hate it. Let's get it out of here. I don't like it. If I didn't know what the UK cover looks like, I probably wouldn't mind it so much. Here is the UK cover. I have had to censor it a little bit, but I think it's, well, it's a little cheeky, if you'll allow me a pun. But it's so much more fun. It's so much more to the point. It lets you know exactly what this book is and what it's about. It's gay men on Fire Island. Boom. Boom. 
the American cover feels like it's whitewashing all of this out. And again, if I didn't know that the UK cover for the paperback of this book was so incredibly cool, maybe I wouldn't care so much. But I refuse to put the American cover up. It's all about the UK one for me. All about it. So, yes. <laughs> Here's what it says. Fire Island, a thin strip of beach off the Long Island coast, has long been a vital space in the queer history of America. Both utopian and exclusionary, healing and destructive, the island is a locus of contradictions, all of which coalesce against a stunning ocean backdrop. Now, I was born on Long Island and spent large parts of my life living there. And I remember going to Fire Island as a kid, but the sort of straight areas. So I've never really been to Gay Fire Island, and yet I'm very aware of the lore of it. I have, my father used to have friends who would go to Fire Island every summer and spend a lot of time there, and I would be fascinated to read a history book about it. I know it sort of gets into Jack Parlett's own experience of Fire Island, and uh, that would be interesting as well. So that is something I will probably cash in a credit for on Libro, because I think audio would be a sort of easy way to read this book. And I find I do really well with nonfiction in audio format. Then we have a book that I do have a physical copy of, but I feel like I'm putting it on my audio pile of possibilities because I have access to an audio of it. It's Yerba Buena by Nina LaCour. This is something I've wanted to read. And Abby from Montana Book Company told me that she loved it and she thought I would love it. And it's been a couple of months at this point and I haven't gotten to it. So I think that's one reason I'm putting it on my pile of possibilities. It's another reason I'm allowing myself to do the audio, even though I have a copy of the book. Sarah Foster runs away from home at 16, leaving behind the girl she once was, capable of trust and intimacy. Years later, in Los Angeles, she is a sought-after bartender, renowned as much for her brilliant cocktails as for the mystery that clings to her. Across the city, Emily Dubois is in a holding pattern, yearning for the beauty and community her Creole grandparents cultivated, but unable to commit. On a whim, she takes a job arranging flowers at the glamorous restaurant Yerba Buena. The morning Emily and Sarah first meet at Yerba Buena, their connection is immediate. But soon, Sarah's old life catches up to her, upending everything she thought she wanted, just as Emily has finally gained her own sense of purpose. Will their love be more powerful than their past? I love the idea of people trying to figure out how to sort their emotional baggage. And, you know, I, I think it would be a fascinating book. I love complicated family stories as well, so that seems like it would be right up my alley. Then we have Let's Talk About Love by Claire Can. Alice had her whole summer planned, non-stop, all-you-can-eat buffets while marathoning her favorite TV shows, Best Friends totally included. I should mention this is YA. With the smallest dash of adulting, working at the library to pay her share of the rent, the only thing missing from her perfect plan? Her girlfriend, who ended things when Alice confessed she's asexual. Alice is done with dating. No thank you. Do not pass go. Stick a fork in her. Done. But then Alice meets Takumi, and she can't stop thinking about him or the rom-com grade romance feels she did not ask for. Uncertainty, butterflies, and swoons? Oh my. When her blissful summer takes an unexpected turn, and Takumi becomes her knight with a shiny library, library employee badge, close enough, Alice has to decide if she's willing to risk their friendship for a love that might not be reciprocated or understood. So... I, again, I, I tried to go light with my audiobooks in particular but to try to balance out any more serious books that I might read. I thought a YA book would be fun for that. And I also really think it's important to include asexual representation. So here it is. And I would love to read it. It's been something that I considered when I wanted to read a book with asexual representation last year. And I ended up doing one by Alice Oseman instead. But I would love to get to this one. Then we have another book I have in print, but I've decided to put the audio on my pile of possibilities. Felix Ever After by Kaysen Callender. Felix Love has never been in love, and yes, he's painfully aware of the irony. He desperately wants to know what it's like and why it seems so easy for everyone but him to find someone. What's worse is that even though he is proud of his identity, Felix also secretly fears that he's one marginalization too many, black, queer, and transgender, to ever get his own happily ever after. When an anonymous student begins sending him transphobic messages after publicly posting Felix's dead name alongside images of him before he transitioned, Felix comes up with a plan for revenge. What he didn't count on, his catfish scenario landing him in a quasi-love triangle. I've heard really good things about this. I've heard some mixed things over the last month, but those were mostly to do with 
people who are adults being annoyed with the way teenagers are. <laughs> so I feel like I'm still really interested in reading it for myself and um, finally getting around to reading it because I've wanted to read it for a very long time. Then we have Under and Santi Were Here by Johnny Garza Villa. This is a new release and one that I would really like to get to. Aristotle and Dante discover the secrets of the universe. I mean, meets The Sun is Also a Star in this YA contemporary love story from Johnny Garza Villa. Ander and Santi were here about a non-binary Mexican-American teen falling for the shy new waiter at their family's taqueria. I mean, it sounds fascinating. And I've heard that the book is a little slowly paced. It's longer than you might expect, but I still really want to read it. And I love that idea of the non-binary representation and about stories about the immigrant experience, all of that. I'm here for it, so I would love to read it. Then we have Only This Beautiful Moment by Abdi Nazemian. Abdi Nazemian wrote Like a Love Story, which is a book I absolutely loved when I read it, and I have always wanted to read another book of his, so this seems like a prime moment, moment to do it. This is a new release. I believe it just came out, and it is the story of three generations of men in a family. In 2019, you have Mood, an out gay teen living in Los Angeles with his distant father, Saeed. When Mood gets the news that his grandfather in Iran is dying, he accompanies his dad to Tehran, where the revolution, revelation of family secrets will force Mood into a new understanding of his history, his culture, and himself. In 1978, Saeed is an engineering student with a promising future ahead of him in Tehran. But when his parents discover his involvement in the country's burgeoning revolution, they send him to safety in America, a country Saeed despises. And even worse, he's forced to live with the American grandmother he never knew existed. In 1939... Bobby, the son of a calculating Hollywood stage mother, lands a coveted MGM studio contract, but the fairy tale world of glamour that he's thrust into has a dark side. Set against the backdrop of Tehran and Los Angeles, this tale of intergenerational trauma and love is an ode to the fragile bonds of family, the hidden secrets of history, and all the beautiful moments that make us who we are today. I mean, that last sentence is everything I love in literature, so I am so on board with this. I mean, so on board. Then we have The Celebrants by Stephen Rowley. I loved The Gunkel, which I read earlier this year, and this is a new release from Stephen Rowley, so I'm very curious. It's been a minute, or five years, since Jordan Vargas last saw his college friends, and 28 years since their graduation when their adult lives officially began. Now, Jordan, Jordy, Naomi, Craig, and Marielle find themselves at the brink of a new decade with all the responsibilities of adulthood, yet no closer to having their lives figured out, though not for a lack of trying. Over the years, they've reunited in Big Sur to honor a decades-old pact to throw each other living funerals, celebrations to remind themselves that life is worth living, that their lives mean something to one another, if not to themselves. But this reunion is different. It sounds really interesting. Again, I really loved The Gunkle, so I would love to read another book by Stephen Rowley. And since this is a new release, it sounds like something that would be kind of perfect for that. Then we have A Scatter of Light by Melinda Lowe. Melinda Lowe won the Young Adult or Younger Reader uh, National Book Award for Last Night at the Telegraph Club, which I read and really liked. I believe last year. And uh, this came out last fall, and it is not a sequel to Last Night at the Telegraph Club. I believe it is set in San Francisco where the events that happened in Last Night at the Telegraph Club are real. I think character or characters from Last Night at the Telegraph Club may factor into this story in some way. So it's sort of a sequel, but mostly not. Last night at the Telegraph Club, author Melinda Lowe returns to the Bay Area with another masterful queer coming-of-age story, this time set against the backdrop of the first major Supreme Court decisions legalizing gay marriage. Again, I loved Last Night at the Telegraph Club, so this is sort of a natural fit for me. Then there had to be a queer romance on here, so we have Chef's Kiss by T.J. Alexander. A high-strung pastry chef's professional goals are interrupted by an unexpected career transition and the introduction of her wildly attractive non-binary kitchen manager in this deliciously fresh and witty queer rom-com. I love a queer rom-com, and I'm here for this, so I would love to. I think Joel read it last year and really enjoyed it, so I'm looking forward to it. Then we have Alice Austin Lived Here by Alex Gino. 
Sam is very in touch with their own queer identity. They're non-binary and their best friend TJ is non-binary as well. Sam's family is very cool with it, as long as Sam remembers that non-binary kids are also required to clean their rooms, do their homework, and try not to antagonize their teachers too much. The teacher respect thing is hard when it comes to Sam's history class because their teacher seems to believe that only dead straight cis white men are responsible for history. When Sam's home, borough of Staten Island, opens up a contest for a new statue, Sam finds the perfect non-DSCWM subject, photographer Alice Austin, whose house has been turned into a museum and who lived with a female partner for decades. Soon, Sam's project isn't just about winning the contest, it's about discovering a rich queer history that Sam is a part of. A queer history that no longer needs to be quiet, as long as there are kids like Sam and TJ to stand up for it. I mean, that last part of that description is everything I love, again, in literature, so I'm so into it. So into it. All right, I have one more book from a pile of possibilities for Pride Month on the audio division. The Lesbiana's Guide to Catholic School by Sonora Reyes. I believe this was on the long list for the Younger Reader National Book Award uh, last year and didn't make it onto the shortlist, but the title had really grabbed my attention and it sounds really interesting. So I have always had it in my mind that I would like to read it. This seems like a good opportunity to read The Lesbiana's Guide to Catholic School by Sonora Reyes. 16-year-old Yamila Flores prefers to be known for her killer eyeliner, not for being one of the only Mexican kids at her new, mostly white, very rich Catholic school. But at least here, no one knows she's gay, and Yami intends to keep it that way. After being outed by her crush and ex-best friend before transferring to Slayton Catholic, Yami has new priorities. Keep her brother out of trouble, make her mom proud, and most importantly, don't fall in love. Granted, she's never been great at any of those things, but that's a problem for future Yami. So obviously, she start, goes to this new school, and keeping those promises becomes complicated. I would love to read it. So that's my pile of possibilities for Pride Month. If you have feedback about any of these books or the things I've talked about, if you have recommendations, it's a little late, late for recommendations, but I'd love to hear them anyway because I might be able to use them for the future. Let me know all of that in the comment section down below. As always, I really appreciate your time. I hope you have a great month reading with pride, and I look forward to hearing what you read. Let me know what's on your list. And uh, as always, I appreciate your time. I will be back. Until next time, happy reading.